my presentation today is Atlantis Mu and the Power System of the Gods. More books have been written about Atlantis than any other subject, except possibly the Bible. And the, the Bible itself also tells the story of Atlantis. Atlantis is, in my mind, Atlantis is, is the world before our own. If, if there was a civilization that was before 10,000 BC, uh, we'll try and give it a name. I call it Atlantis. And we'll now we'll see as we go along that Atlantis has in fact been pinpointed all over the world, uh, not just under the ocean like in the Atlantic, but in the Sahara, uh, in Indonesia, Antarctica, uh, America as well has been said to have been Atlantis. The story of Atlantis is an Egyptian story. It's an Egyptian story that was told to the Greek uh, philosopher Plato. Plato then wrote, writes about Atlantis in two of his dialogues. And in fact, the Egyptians who were telling Plato's uh, uh, uncle, Solon, who was at a, at a temple in Egypt, they said, you Greeks are, are like kids. You, you don't even know your own history. And they go on to tell him that uh, Greece is a much older country than you, the Greeks, even know about and think about. And then he goes on to tell them the story of Atlantis. Atlantis is, according to the Egyptians and Plato's, was beyond the pillars of Hercules and somewhere in the Atlantic. Although, as I was saying, uh, Atlantis has been placed uh, everywhere from uh, small islands in the Aegean to actually in the Sahara. Uh, we have here the Bimini Road. Atlantis was a concentric city of uh, concentric circles and land and canals. Uh, it was a great seafaring uh, city, according to Plato. There was a mountain to the north of Atlantis. Uh, and today, in fact, one of the Azores Mountains uh, islands is this very high uh, peak. Called, uh, called Pico, and it just may well have been the, uh, the, the mountain of Atlantis. Atlantis was an area of many elephants. They had, uh, there was a lot of metallurgy there, and a special kind of a metal called orichalcum. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about Mu. James, this is one of James Churchward's maps. He claimed that you know, a lot of uh, uh, civilization started in Mu. People traveled around across the Amazon Sea over to Atlantis and Africa. We'll see more of that in a little bit. Recently, off of Cuba, uh, a Canadian-Russian-Cuban expedition looking for sunken ships was using um, a, a remote-controlled uh, sub. And they took these photos. This is at 2,000 feet on the western part of uh, Cuba. And what they what they claimed in the news, and, and this, is, this has now been about six years, and uh, not much has come out from this. This is the only photo. But they claimed that they saw uh, streets, pyramids, uh, what they felt was a city grid. Uh, this is off, you know, off Cuba. So suddenly, yeah, we're looking for and finding underwater ruins, in this case, 2,000 feet deep. This is the Bimini Wall in uh, off uh, Florida and the Bahamas. This was a, a popular place that Edgar Cayce talked about, also the Hall of Records. Diving here, it's only about 30 feet deep. It's a, quite an easy dive. And what you see are these blocks of stone that are like pillow shaped and things like that. And that's kind of uh, something that naturally interests me a lot when it comes to Atlantis and Moon and things like that is underwater ruins. These ruins here are at underwater. They're in off Greece. This is an uh, underwater city called Elephanesos. There are over 200 known sunken cities in the Mediterranean alone. But it's finding sunken cities outside the Mediterranean that, that's particularly interesting. And mainstream archaeology has problems with sunken cities that aren't in the Mediterranean. The whole idea, too, of the Aegean. Uh, there are maps as well, and it's in like the maps of ancient sea kings where they there are really old maps of the Aegean that show a lot more islands in the Aegean than there are today. And it's thought that there has been sea changes there that has moved it. This is Karnak, 
in uh, Brittany, in France, giant rows of uh, huge standing stones. Many of them just actually go into the ocean off of uh, just, just near uh, the Land's End and the, the English Channel. According to mainstream archaeologists today, the oldest ruins on our planet are on Malta. And they're dating these ruins to about 7,000 BC. And this is getting to the time of Atlantis as Plato at around 10,000 BC. There's evidence, too, that what happened around 10,000 BC was that the Mediterranean was hit by a giant tsunami. And a massive wave of water came out of the Atlantic and basically wiped out the Mediterranean. And at Malta, there's evidence of this, too, where there were uh, pygmy elephants and uh, hippopotamus and things, and they were all washed into this cave. And the, the idea there, too, was that during Atlantean times, it was, the Mediterranean was, uh, was a, a valley with lakes in it. And they, this was connected to ancient Egypt and was it's called in uh, some books, including mine, the Osirian civilization, named after Osiris. Some of the enigmatic ruins around the world, ones that are particularly interesting to me, and I'm trying to get there, are the ruins at Baalbek in Lebanon. And at Baalbek are the largest known cut blocks. Some of these weigh 2,000 tons. Uh, the only thing that's really similar to these is like the obelisks in Egypt, including this is the, uh, what's called the unfinished obelisk near Aswan. It also weighs about 1,000 tons. So the idea of quarrying these giant blocks, moving them, is, is, a, is a serious problem to archaeologists. At Baalbek, what they tried, in order to figure out how they could possibly move these giant stone blocks, 2,000 tons and things like that, this French archaeologist came up with this system of what they call um, uh, Allen, uh, Allen stones that fit into a, like a T junction. And then he had this whole concept where you build a giant cage around these huge blocks like this. You've got all these pulleys. The pulleys are locked in with these hourglass shaped blocks like this. You've got a winch. And what you're trying to do is move a 2,000 ton block. And after building this giant cage and everything around this thing, you're going to move it like a few inches. <laughs> Today, Baalbek is said to, uh, according to mainstream archaeologists, it's said to be, have been built by the Romans. And there is a Roman temple built on top of Baalbek. But how the Romans could have ever have, have built Baalbek or moved those stones, archaeologists can't figure it out. In the ancient world, too, uh, a group called the Hittites were uh, also very similar to the Egyptians, their main city is a city called Hattusis, which is in central Turkey today. That city was, it became a vitrified city, with, and it has melted rocks and things like that. A strange thing associated with the Hittites happened up in the uh, upper peninsula of Michigan back in the late 1800s, where they found this stone, and they called it the Newberry Stone. And uh, it was sent to the Smithsonian Institution. This is the Newberry Stone. This is part of it right here. And it had all these strange writing on it. And the, the writing in it, no one could decipher it. And this, it was at the Smithsonian for a while. And the Smithsonian then sent it back to this farmer in Michigan who had found it. And they said, we, you know, we don't know what this, what, what's on this stone. You keep it. We don't want it. In the end, and this was all in like 1890 or so, and, uh, but finally Barry Fell of the Epigraphic Society, and he, he was a Harvard professor, was able to decipher this stone. He said, this is ancient Hittite. This Hittite, Hittites who, and the Hittites had controlled Cyprus, much of the Eastern Mediterranean. And what's curious about a Hittite stone like this was the Hittites themselves were not really discovered as a civilization until like 1910. So it would have been impossible for someone to have faked Hittite writing, forged a fake stone, because people didn't even know this language at the time that they found the Newberry Stone. One of the things that I've always been interested in is going around the world is what's called keystone cuts. And we'll see that this is from an old National Geographic. This is actually a building of the Parthenon. But this is what is known as a keystone clamp and cut, where you cut these 
T-shaped clamps on either side of a giant blocks, and then you pour molten metals into it. And we're going to see more of that as we go along. Other very unusual megalithic ruins that uh, are often associated with Atlantis are what's known as the Osirion. This is actually down in a swamp in central Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians themselves built a huge temple around this building. Notice here, too, uh, these, are, these are blocks of uh, granite that are uh, weighing not like 2,000 tons or something like that, but like 100 tons or a couple of hundred tons. And notice here some of these like little curious knobs on blocks. Uh, you see certain notching and stuff. Uh, the Egyptian government spent 15 years pumping the water out of this swamp so that they could actually get to these ruins and, and see what was there. There's no Egyptian hieroglyphs on these ruins. And it's really thought by many Egyptologists, uh, including John Anthony West and others, that, that what's at the Osirion is really pre-Egyptian, or what we often call pre-dynastic. All right, now we're going to Cuzco, uh, high in the mountains of uh, Peru. This is a famous stone. This is known as the Stone of 12 Angles. It actually appears on the uh, Cuzco beer uh, that you get when you're there. And the kind of, of perfect fitting of these polygonal blocks, there's no mortar. Uh, it's a kind of a jigsaw construction. This is, the, this is really the most sophisticated construction we know of, where blocks are locked in together like a jigsaw. And when earthquake shock waves will hit these walls, they move independently, but the blocks are all locked together so that rather than shearing like a brick wall or something, these walls hold together even during really strong earthquakes. You can see, too, how this street in Cusco, you see a, a very old megalithic uh, construction at the bottom then another layer of smaller stones, and it seems to have been built later. It's also very fine stone, but it's not uh, as, as perfect and large as, as the lower sections. And in fact, I mean, it's, as you look at certain of these walls and things, it's the oldest parts that are the most sophisticated, the most amazing, and, and the later stuff is, is um, much more easy to construct. This, in fact, is now the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo. And it looks very similar to this, uh, identical to the kind of polygonal jigsaw blocks that you see in Peru. Uh, this is actually in Japan. This is the Emperor's Palace. Uh, but it's this, if, if you were actually to show like these walls, and they're very ancient, probably many thousands of years old, and it's why the, the uh, Emperor's there. But if you were to show these to people in Peru, they would think that these were walls in Peru. You also have construction like this at the Necromanticon, which is an underground ruins that were only discovered in the 1960s. They are in northwest Greece, up near the Albanian border. And in fact, the, they too are um, uh, associated with the River Styx and Hades and the sort of world before our own that's gone. You can also see how these uh, blocks are very oddball shaped and polygonal jigsaw but locked in together. This is the city of Cuzco and above Cuzco is the massive fortress of Sacsayhuaman, one of the wonders of the world. The gigantic blocks of stone perfectly fitted together. This was The Incas themselves uh, had a big battle with the Spanish when they first uh, tried, were conquering Peru. Again, you see these polygonal blocks perfectly fitted together. It's quite amazing. According to mainstream archaeologists, these giant walls were built only a few hundred years before the Spanish got there. That's what they say. But they can't figure out how they would build these things again. Oh, yet the Incas supposedly did not know the wheel. They didn't know writing. Yet they would build these allegedly giant you know, walls and fortresses out of huge blocks of stone. This is Machu Picchu, the famous city in Peru. Machu Picchu is a secret city. It's a megalithic city. It's high on a mountain uh, overlooking the Urubamba River. It is a megalithic city. 
you can see, again, different sections. This is the famous uh, uh, room of three windows. You see, again, megalithic blocks here. Notice the notching. But look up here on top. You see what is, you know, pretty crummy stone walls. Um, but all this is, you know, uh, original, as, just as the, the Spanish and themselves never discovered Machu Picchu. And it wasn't discovered until 1914 when a Yale... Uh, guy named Hiram Bingham was looking for the lost city of the Incas, and he uh, was, is credited as the discoverer of Machu Picchu. But again, you can see here how you have the megalithic walls, and they've been pulled apart by earthquakes and settling and things like that. More of these walls, notice the perfect uh, notching. Oh, here again, you have this curious uh, kind of knobs and things like that. They don't know what the purpose of these things are. This is also at Machu Picchu as well. You have here this giant blocks like this. This wall is pulling apart and starting to collapse, probably uh, from uh, earthquakes and settling and stuff like that. Also, another strange wall at Machu Picchu, perfectly fitted together blocks. This is the other side of it. This wall is very uh, interesting. And notice the large lichen patches and things like that that you see. That's indicative of great age. On the way to Machu Picchu, as you're going down the Urubamba River, you come to a massive fortress known as Ollante Tambo. And at, as you go up the, the stairs and the, the terracing, you again encounter these giant walls of perfectly fitting polygonal megaliths. Notice again, these curious knobs and things like that. We've seen that too at the Osirion in Egypt. Uh, it's very amazing construction. Here, large lichen patches, these knobs coming through. You can really see how the builders are, I mean, they went to great effort to perfectly fit these blocks. And exactly how you're going to move giant blocks and fit them together has also baffled archaeologists, even leading to the theory that some of these blocks are actually somehow melted and then molded and formed. You can see here, too, this is also at Ayante Tambo. They do things where they do corners, very difficult things, where they bring an entire block and, and then make a corner out of it so that it's actually all one block. Now, here again, you see these giant blocks fitting together. But again, also look up here, this really kind of crummy uh, building material. Now, as you get up to the top of the Sun Temple at Ollante Tambo, you start to really see some very strange things, including giant blocks that are fitted together. This is the main wall here, it, which, is, which is known as the Sun Temple there at Cuzco. This has uh, like five huge blocks of granite fitted together with very narrow sheets of granite between it. It's quite curious. This photo right here is, in my mind, very much the smoking gun that the Incas did not build these walls. And so if you look here, this is what you see uh, at the top of Ayante Tambo. And it, this is exactly as it was when the Spanish first got there. It's still like it today. During Inca times, this is what it looks like. Giant blocks that are weighing 100, 200 tons are still are just lying around. Some of them even have other rubble behind them. Look at this block over here. So here we have the edge of the, the, the main wall at the Sun Temple. And now, this wall here, we were just looking at it. You see a notching over here. Look at this crummy rubble that's between these blocks here. Um, mainstream archaeologists are saying, well, this is how the Incas built stuff. They just dragged a giant block you know, up this hill, notched it right here for another giant block that's going to be perfectly fitted together. But then they decided, oh, heck, I'm tired of fitting all these giant blocks together. It's pain. Oh, we'll just fill it in with all this little crubby rubble, you know, and that'll be good enough for us, you know. Uh, and this is what mainstream archaeologists are saying. Uh, they're saying, yeah, this is, uh, the Incas just built like this. But in fact, what's really going on, in, in my mind, is you know, th this giant block was meant to have another giant block. This is Inca construction right here. That's Inca construction. 
This other giant blocks, this is what you know, we call Atlantean construction. So you're looking here, even like knobs like this would have had other giant blocks fitted together. All these blocks that are lying around were all part of a structure. That structure was destroyed probably in some massive cataclysmic earthquake. Um, the whole thing is highly, highly curious. Now, one of these blocks that's sitting around here, or a number of them, have what are called keystone cuts on them. And this is what we were looking at before. These blocks, here's a keystone cut. Now, you know, you, in order to use a keystone cut, you're going to have to have another giant block fitted up next to it. It, too, has a corresponding keystone cut like this. You can't build with only one of these. You've got to have one on each side of a block, and they're fitted together, and they're, then they they're, have things, molten metals are just poured in there. So if you look here, more of these keystone cuts. Now, we'll, we'll see more of that in a little bit with the keystone cuts. This is a satellite image of, a, of the Peruvian jungle. This is a Landsat 2 satellite taken in the 80s. This is the Madre de Dios jungles of eastern Peru. This thing right in here, this kind of egg carton shape, is a series of like eight giant pyramids in the jungle. And the Peruvian government has sent expeditions in there. The military's flown helicopters into this area. Expeditions have gone here, vanished in the jungle. And even today, like trying to get to these actual pyramids is extremely difficult and dangerous. Um, if, as you go higher up into the Altiplano of Peru, you get to Lake Titicaca. Uh, there are also these curious towers. Machu Picchu also had a tower on it. Uh, Sacsayhuaman, the fortress above Cusco, also had a strange tower. And these towers are quite megalithic. As you, also around uh, uh, Lake Titicaca, you have, and it's, we're getting near to Tiwanaku, these kind of bug-eyed statues become very common. This is all in the area around uh, Lake Titicaca. Also, you see some of these curious knobs here. They don't know what these towers were for. Mainstream archaeologists say, oh, they were like burial towers, but they are pre-Inca. As you go along the west side of Lake Titicaca, you will see this thing. And it, this is known as this Stargate. And it's a, a curious uh, feature that's cut into this solid rock wall. It's a giant door. Uh, apparently, at some time, it was other blocks or structures were fitted into this. Um, it's, no one can really figure out what this thing would have been for, why it's there. The locals who live around this thing call it the devil's doorway. Uh, it's been called a stargate. People claim that uh, they have interdimensional experiences and things like that here. Uh, it's, a, it's like a false door. And this was also something that the Egyptians did a lot. And this is at the Giza Plateau. Um, but this is something the Egyptians would do this too. They would carve these false doors. Uh, and, which, and, and the purpose of that too, um, we're not exactly sure of. Once you get uh, on the south side of Lake Titicaca, you come to the really amazing ruins of Tiwanaku. Tiwanaku itself is, no, is known to be pre-Inca. Um, some people have said that Tiwanaku was built 15,000 years ago. It had a pyramid. It was a metallurgical city. There are underwater ruins around Lake Titicaca, Lake Titicaca itself. Is a very mysterious lake. It's a, it's a freshwater lake today, but it was thought to be a saltwater lake and somehow connected to the ocean uh, over 10,000 years ago. One of the strange things about Lake Titicaca is that there is a type of a seahorse that lives in Lake Titicaca. Today, Lake Titicaca is over 12,000 feet in the Andes Mountains. But at, at one time, Lake Titicaca was apparently connected to like the Pacific Ocean. And this was something that, like Churchward said, one of the most famous things at Tiwanaku is the famous Gate of the Sun. This supposedly has Viracocha, the sun god there. Uh, this is the backside of the Gate of the Sun. Notice here, again, 
uh, oddball notching and things like that. Other giant walls would have been fitted together. This Gate of the Sun is curious in itself in that it is in an oddball place. It's really from a few miles away. It's almost like somebody in ancient times moved this giant gate uh, a couple of miles to where it is, uh, sort of like trying to show attention to these ruins. But yeah, these, that gate and other areas would have, at, around Puma Punku, would have all been part of these massive buildings. They think today, too, that Tiwanaku was some kind of massive metallurgical plant. It has tunnels going through it. They diverted uh, rivers to wash ore, things like that. Uh, there's a sunken temple at Tiwanaku with all of these heads are placed in the walls. Uh, some archaeologists say that all the races of mankind are uh, represented in these various faces and heads there. This is one of the monolithic statues at Tiwanaku. Uh, the, the bug eyed kind of guys, they're wearing turbans. That's something also that's been often associated with Atlantis that Atlanteans wore a, a kind of a, a turban that was knotted in the front. Um, very much like Sikhs wear today, and also what we kind of think of um, with, uh, say, Arabian Nights and things like that. This is also uh, at Tiwanaku. Here, this is, in, in fact, this area is closed off now uh, when we were there in September. But you can see here what is part of this weird tunnel system that goes all underneath Tiwanaku, and they believe that this was all part of this vast metallurgical processing plant that was Tiwanaku. This is the famous Kontiki statue, uh, Thor Heyerdahl named one of his reed rafts after this, Kontiki. Uh, the tiki as well is known all throughout the Pacific. Uh, if you go to the Marquesas, even the word tiki is thought to be very much a Pacific Polynesian word. But this Kontiki is high in uh, the Andes Mountains at Tiwanaku. He's holding his uh, hands over his heart and stomach. This is the tiki. This is, this is a special way of holding your hands, and you see that in Pacific Islands. He also is a bearded, mustached guy. And uh, American Indians, that's something about American Indians really is that they do not have facial hair. And American Indians do not need to shave and cannot grow beards or mustaches. The idea, too, of Tiwanaku as this massive pyramid city and uh, with giant blocks of stone. This is the Puma Punku area. This is where the Gate of the Sun actually came from. Here you also see 200 ton blocks of red granite. And we're seeing again what we saw in Ollante Tambo, what we see in other parts of the world, which are these keystone cuts. And here again, you have these cuts, and molten metals are poured into these cuts to form these clamps. And it's, it's kind of a curious way, and a very unusual way, of fitting giant stone blocks together. And these stone blocks are so huge that you wouldn't even think that they would need to have these uh, clamps and things in it. But once you get around Pumapunku and other areas of Tiwanaku, you start seeing these, the keystone cuts for the clamps. The whole area uh, was also apparently hit by a giant tidal wave. It was buried under uh, many feet of muck and mud. Archaeologists today are still digging it out, doing what they call um, trenching. This is what's known as the Andean Cross, if you can see it there. It's a kind of a, a Swiss cross that's carved into these blocks. This is typical trenching that archaeologists do. This is at Pumapunku near Tiwanaku. Here you can see they've excavated all this mud and muck that's covering uh, this, these blocks. And then here are more of the keystone cuts. The clamps are taken out usually, and, uh, but they still do find some clamps, and we'll, we'll see some in a minute. Yeah, the idea here that, in fact, is what archaeologists do is they leave these blocks. These are weighing, uh, oh, maybe you know, 1,000, 2,000 pounds. But they just leave them on the pillars of mud and muck that, uh, that, that essentially destroyed these things and buried them in some kind of tidal wave. All right, here we are. Here's uh, keystone cuts with the clamps in place. These ones are in Egypt. 
these are in at if you go to Karnak at Luxor in Egypt, other areas, you also see keystone cuts, just exactly as we're seeing in Peru and other areas. And again, this is a really unusual way of fitting giant blocks together. This is in Egypt too. This is uh, on uh, the Isle of Philae, which is near Aswan. And here, this is actually a vertical wall. And here we see also keystone cuts. But those, this wall has been reconstructed. This is not how, whoever originally built this wall, put those keystone cuts in there, did not make this wall. Keystone cuts cannot be on a vertical wall like this. Somebody has dismantled some other wall and put the blocks back together, you know, and they put some of them where they were, but they're not. See, like, look over here. These are keystone cuts, but there's no corresponding things. But those keystone cuts have to be actually on a flat surface because molten metals are poured into them. But, I mean, this is a really good example to me of how, you know, walls and ancient, uh, you know, cities and stuff like that are, they're destroyed or abandoned, then they're dismantled, and then they're reconstructed. And, and you, the building material's right there. You don't have to go to another quarry, you can just use all these blocks that are lying around. This is what they think Puma Punku looked like, archaeologists in the 30s tried to reconstruct it. it. I mean, the whole thing is just totally leveled and destroyed. But you see, you can see what some of the ideas of what this building looked like. I mean, it was amazing. Perfect engineering. I mean, whoever is making this is, you know, the consummate builder and, and um, uh, stonemason. So this was this building. Uh, today, this is this area of, uh, this is Bolivia is a very bleak, cold area. And this is also uh, the origin of the potato. It comes from around Lake Titicaca. There's over 200 varieties of potatoes. But you can really see how amazing and, and wonderful this, this building would have been. These are clamps at the museum in Tiwanaku. Only in the last 10 years or so, they have been, they've built two museums there to house much of the stuff. Uh, Bolivia is, uh, unfortunately, the poorest country in South America and has a lot of serious economic problems, and, but they're trying to get more and more tourists. This is a guy, uh, some uh, pottery. Notice how he's also wearing a kind of a turban. These are also some of the pottery figures found at Tiwanaku. This guy looking uh, uh, kind of like an oriental uh, sort of guy, not very American Indian. This guy, too, has a mustache and a beard. He does not look like an American Indian at all. You find also these, what I like call cone heads, the people with, the, uh, with these extended craniums. You find this a lot in, uh, in Peru and all over the world. Um, this is what some of these guys look like, and they had huge uh, double size heads and stuff like that. Here's also one. So the Olmecs did this too down in Mexico. In fact, these are Olmec figurines here from around the Gulf of Mexico. This is what these guys look like, or at least some of them. There are ways to do this. We don't know why people uh, did this uh, extended cranium thing. Uh, when you're still an infant, you can, uh, you can bind, like the Chinese did this with feet. They felt that uh, women with small deformed feet were very sexy. And they did foot binding. And they can do this to the head. And before the plates in your head fuse together, you can, you can, you can force the skull into various um, artificial kind of things. Now, also, Tutankhamun and the Otnists did this. And uh, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, Tutankhamun, their daughters, they also had these extended craniums. And this is uh, a bust of Tutankhamun in his, um, uh, from his tomb. Oftentimes when you see you know, pictures of his mommy or things, they don't really mention this, that he had the extended cranium. But you can really see that they, they did this. This was still being done. This was done by Kurds in northern Iraq. Even remote islands were doing this. We, uh, right up to the turn of the century, they, there were certain African tribes in the Congo and stuff that were still doing this head binding. This little kid is, has, I mean, that is his head right there. And it's being you know, bound and everything. 
So now we'll, we'll talk a, some about the whole concept of this Lemuria of Mu in the Pacific. The whole concept of Lemuria comes out of the early geology of the 1800s. And as geologists at that time were trying to figure out what was going on, the, the whole idea of continents were fitted together. You had concepts like Gondwana land and Pangaea. Uh, there was cer certain things came out like the expanding Earth as well, and this also helped the, the continents fit together. Uh, it's the Theosophical Society then began talking about Lemuria, uh, which was originally coined by a, a German geologist, and he used Lemuria because of the lemurs that were found in uh, Madagascar and also uh, in Malaysia and things like that. So he, he thought there was a continent that spread across the Indian Ocean. They called it Lemuria. Uh, you know, the, the Awaspi book also, uh, which was um, channeled by a, a Chicago dentist, actually, and he talked also about what he called Pan, and this was, a, this was a, also a Pacific continent, and uh, according to Awaspi, this was civilization, an early man began in the Pacific. A guy named uh, James Churchward, who wrote the famous uh, Lost Continent of Moo books, he also proposed that there was this Pacific continent. Uh, Churchward claimed that he had uh, been given secret information in India, that uh, he had these teachers, the Rishis, who had uh, given him access to secret libraries. They told him and basically sent him on a mission across the Pacific to, to find evidence for this lost continent of Mu. He had been a colonel in the British Army and then he'd been stationed in India. The more I, I found out about Churchward and, and uh, uh, researched him, I was, became quite amazed. And in fact, he was an extremely wealthy person uh, in the end. And he, though he was British, he moved to uh, the United States and he lived uh, around Pittsburgh. And he became a millionaire, a multimillionaire, because he was the inventor of essentially stainless steel. And later it was claimed that he, Bethlehem Steel Corporation had to pay him royalties on all the stainless steel that he, what they were producing. And it got so bad at one point, because they were giving, he was making so much money off the Bethlehem Steel Corporation that they allegedly tried to kill him. And when, <laughs> When he was touring the Bethlehem uh, steel plant one time, this was like 1920 or so, uh, this giant cauldron of molten steel, and suddenly you know, it was like they tried to pour it on him, you know, and he jumped away, and he was like, wow, they're trying to kill me. So later on, but then he began, and it was in the late 20s that he wrote the books, The Lost Con of Mu, uh, his sequel was The Children of Mu, and then he wrote uh, three other Mu books as well. Just recently came back from uh, Costa Rica and Nicaragua where they have these curious giant stone spheres. These, these granite balls that are just found uh, in the jungles of the southwestern Costa Rica. Many of them are huge, others are, are smaller. Um, some are as big as like a car. Uh, they're perfectly spherical. And uh, it's one of the most difficult things to do, I'm told, is to try and create, uh, you know, just like a hammer and a chisel or something, a perfect sphere of, you know, just eyeballing it. So exactly how they would make these. And it's one of the curious things, too, with these stone spheres is uh, exactly, you know, uh, what they were used for. Or, um, I mean, they, they really can't even figure out why they would have these stone spheres. The stone spheres uh, in Costa Rica are, all come from this area down uh, uh, in, around here, and this is actually the border with, with Panama. There's even an island right over in here, and it has these stone spheres on it as well. At the museum in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica, they've got some of these spheres. One of them is, is actually cracked open, and there's some hieroglyphs on that. Uh, it was, I mean, mainstream archaeologists say that, well, these stone spheres are from like 800 A.D., and they're like, you know, ceremonial objects, right? Uh, since, you know, they don't know what they would possibly use them for or why they would have. 
This is also in the San Jose Museum, and he is a, a, a hunchbacked Coca-Pelli kind of a guy, also with the extended uh, cranium, looking very much like an Olmec, in fact. Uh, for whatever reason, in Costa Rica, these spheres were so highly regarded as special objects that they would often bury kings and stuff like that, and they would put one of these stone balls in the graves and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, right, the bowling uh, balls of the gods kind of thing. I've, I've just, it's been really since I went to Costa Rica, and I've always been interested in these stone spheres, and it, these stone balls are found around the world, and I kind of realized that, you know, they're, 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 you know that they're, the, the biggest concentration is in Costa Rica. Well, get this. At the uh, turn of the century in Los Angeles, they were building this trolley system uh, right around Santa Monica. And so they brought these steam shovels in, and they started scraping away various hills, you know, so that the, the tracks, you know, will have a fairly level way to go. And what they uncovered in this hill was all these stone balls at Los Angeles. And a guy who reads our magazine, World Explorer, you know, sent us this, this whole thing. And he's like, yeah, you know, I've been reading your magazine, and, uh, you know, I've seen your, some of your books, and... I thought you'd be interested in these stone balls they found in Los Angeles 100 years ago. And I was like, yeah, right. So, and, and then, and I don't know where these things are now. Uh, at the time, the newspapers called them dinosaur eggs, right? <laughs> as you go through the Pacific and as you start traveling, particularly in Indonesia, this is in Bali, uh, a, a number of books have been written recently that Indonesia is also a kind of an Atlantis. This is also in Indonesia. Uh, the whole uh, 10,000 years ago, they think that rice also originated around Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Churchward believed that areas like Indonesia and Sri Lanka, Ceylon, and the Maldive Islands were all connected uh, as much larger um, mini continents and things like this. This is one of Churchward's drawings. Even uh, most recently, a couple of books have come out of India and uh, where these uh, Tamil Nadu scholars of the Tamils are the people who live in the very southern part of India and, and Madras, uh, they now call it Chennai, uh, is, is the main capital there. But yeah, these uh, Indian scholars have recently also come out saying that, well, the original Tamil Nadu, where we're all from, is all under, it's underwater now. And it, that, uh, kind of like what Churchward was saying, that this whole area of southern India, going into Sri Lanka and all these areas, even going to Australia, is this submerged homeland of the Tamils. And, and, and in fact, they call it, want to call it Lemuria. As you go uh, into... Um, Southeast Asia, you get to Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Uh, it's my opinion, and uh, Graham Hancock, uh, a friend of mine, also agrees with me that, that what you see at, at, in uh, Angkor Wat in Cambodia is much older than they, than they say. Angkor Wat is an area where you have what originally was at Angkor Wat was a bunch of Hindu temples. It was also part of the Nagas. Churchward talked about Nagas. Uh, this is the Naga serpent right here. Later, Buddhists became, took over all this area, and that would have been about 500 BC. And they, what they did was then carve Buddhas into all these temples that were originally Hindu temples. And at Angkor Wat, you see the same thing we were seeing at Tiwanaku, also in Egypt, and that is keystone cuts. The same kind of keystone cuts cut in with the clamps and things like that. In fact, uh, Right now, uh, Japanese archaeologists are doing a lot of the excavations around Angkor Wat, and them finding these clamps and keystone cuts is uh, one of their uh, main discoveries, in fact. Thor Heyerdahl, whom I met uh, in Peru back in 1990, one of his books was called The Maldive Mystery. He maintained that the Maldives, which also are, according to Churchward, another part, part of this sunken mini continent, but he said that right at the equator is this a very important channel with the Maldives called the Zero Degree Channel. Thor Heyerdahl did excavations in the Maldives. He also found uh, what very fine stone masonry that he felt was connected 
with the kind of masonry that was in Peru and Egypt and all over the world. Also, there were st Buddhist statues found in the Maldives. Notice the very long ears. And this was something, this is a very Buddhist thing of these extended earlobes. Uh, and the Easter Island people also had these extended earlobes when they got there. And the Incas, too, were also thought to have these extended earlobes, a very, very Buddhist thing, ultimately. And this is, uh, this is supposedly a depiction of one of the Incas. You can see his extended earlobes and things. This is a rare photo in the island of Biak, uh, which is part of New Guinea, actually, but the Indonesian part of New Guinea. This was a t photo taken about 1920, and it's one of the few uh, kind of modern megalithic building photos where these guys, as you can see, are uh, moving giant blocks as best they can. I mean, they have to get a whole crowd of people, but they're moving probably about a 2,000, you know, uh, pound block or something there. European archaeologists, particularly uh, French archaeologists, were very much what they call diffusionists. And within archaeology, anthropology, there's two main schools. There's diffusionism versus what's called normally isolationism. Isolationism is largely what we're taught in school today, where uh, Ancient civilizations are isolated from each other. They don't have much contact. You don't have transoceanic voyages. Uh, and so it, within that whole idea of isolationists, you know, the, whatever went on in Mexico and, and Peru and building pyramids doesn't have anything to do with Egypt or any other country. All these countries are isolated from each other. But diffusionists say, no, people, uh, you know, oceans aren't barriers. Oceans are highways. People traveled all over the world in these times, and across the Pacific. The Pacific is like one-third of uh, the surface of the Earth, and it's a huge, vast area. One of the mysteries, too, of the Pacific is, uh, is the whole mystery of Polynesians. And in fact, this is a Polynesian who's on an, off of the, uh, an island off New Guinea. And it's kind of the, the, the dispersion of the different types of people around the Pacific is, is one of the big mysteries. This is an island north of Fiji called Rotuma, and it's a very, it's a remote island. Not many people have gone there. The Fijian government would not allow tourists to go there for many years. Uh, I was one of the first um, tourists to ever go to this place, and uh, there's all, all there was on this island was a very small guest house. But what's on Rotuma is a bunch of massive blocks of basalt, and they were somehow carved, uh, moved around. They weigh many, many tons. They don't know what they were for. When I was there, um, an archaeologist from Japan was there, and he was studying these blocks, and he had special magnetometers and stuff on them. And he had some whole theory of, like, these blocks are magnetized. Uh, he apparently was some believer in levitation, that they're, like, levitating these blocks and moving them around. And they're huge. Uh, now, I write about a lot of this stuff in my book on Lost Cities of Ancient Lemuria in the Pacific. There's an island off New Caledonia uh, called the Island of Pines. And French archaeologists in the 60s began excavating these mounds. Inside these mounds, what they found were essentially concrete pillars like, uh, that had been cast inside these mounds. They were able to date them, and they had dated them to be 11,000 years old. And of course, mainstream geology and archaeology wouldn't accept that at all. Throughout the Pacific areas, uh, particularly around Fiji and Tonga, there's what they call Lapita pottery. This is Lapita pottery. Lapita pottery is dated to be uh, over 3,000 years old. So I mean, it's, it's from a time period thought to be about 1,000 BC. This is the time of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, uh, that, that era of the Egyptians. They are able to date pottery. This is a megalithic tomb in Madagascar on the other, uh, across the Indian Ocean. One of the concepts, too, is of the settlement of the Pacific and is the idea of the Egyptians going into the Pacific. This is an Egyptian uh, navigation stick. Uh, the Egyptians had special star charts, and uh, 
the Egyptians also built, like Thor hired all, they built these reed boats. Reed boats are unsinkable. Even if a reed boat it was to break up, every part of it would float. Uh, reed boats also have these very shallow draft and can go over coral reefs and stuff like that. Uh, there's an a Anglo-Egyptian archaeologist who lives, um, lives in London now. He claims the Egyptians went out, settled many islands in the Pacific. And what he pointed out was that many islands, and one, one of the things you find all through the Pacific is the word Ra. Many Pacific islands have, have the word Ra in them, Ra E.T., Ra Panui, uh, Ra this, Ra that. And of course, Ra was the uh, Egyptian sun god. One of the interesting things, too, in Egyptian, uh, with the various kind of Egyptian gods and deities, was the god Bes. Uh, Bes, B E S was his name. Bes was the god of good luck. Bes was, uh, he was a dwarf very similar to Coca Pelli. Uh, he was a, a dwarf, a hunchback, a deformed, but he was a god, but he was, he was good luck, and sailors like to use Bess. This uh, figure right here is actually in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, that's an Egyptian figurine, but it's very, very Pacific. I mean, if you go to Tahiti or something and you see Tonga, you see all the masts and things, this is what they, this is the kind of thing that they carve. And in fact, apparently, it's a depiction of the Egyptian god Bess. When they got to a lot of the early explorers, got to these Pacific islands and stuff, they would find these guys, and they were heavily, heavily tattooed. Many of them had apparently like star maps tattooed on their bodies, uh, what looked like games and things like that, like Parcheesi or uh, uh, other kind of games that the Egyptians played that were similar to that. Also, uh, areas like Tonga, there would be there were large uh, pyramid platforms like this. This is from the voyage of Duff. And when, in fact, if you go to Tonga and you go into the pyramid area of Tonga, uh, you got a sign and it says, "Hey, welcome to Mu Ah, the old capital." And in fact, this is what they called this ancient pyramid section of Tonga was Mu Ah. And this is probably perhaps where Churchward got some of his ideas of Mu. Um, at the time when Churchward traveled out through the Pacific at the turn of the century, it was very ex difficult to travel from island to island and expensive. Today in Tonga, you have these large pyramid platforms, cut stone blocks. Um, this was an interesting old photo that I found. And you notice here how this block, this is in Tonga is also notched like that. This other block is, is fitted in there together. This is actually the back side of that today. And in Tonga, it's, it's interesting. They, the people of Tonga do not want to go to these ruins. They're afraid. And it, you know, they're ghosts there. Uh, they've, they're, they're really quite afraid. I, mean, I, had a ton I was on the radio in Tonga once, and a Tongan guy came to me afterwards. He said, oh, I wish I was an American like you, because I'm a Tongan, and I'm afraid to go to these places. You know, so uh, I, I found that all kind of interesting. But so in Tonga, you have these giant uh, walls, also many of them quite well fitted together, fine stone masonry. Churchward in 1879 went to Tonga. This is the famous uh, trilithon at, at Tonga, the Ha'amanga stone. Here you see it here. Uh, originally, they didn't know what this was for. Today, it's it's pretty well uh, believe that, you know, this was part of an, an astronomical observatory. And, um, but this, this whole giant arch in Tonga, they don't know where the stones came from. And they're not from Tonga. They, they, and in, the legends in Tonga say they came from this other island that's like a 1,000 miles to the north. And so just moving, again, these giant stone blocks around the Pacific would have been extremely difficult. This is actually one of the quarries in Tonga, and it's, a, um, uh, it's partly submerged. You can kind of see where they're cutting. They started to cut blocks, or like a block was cut out of here, another block was cutting out of here. So they're cutting blocks out of essentially the coral reef. In the Pacific, is what they, there's what they call the Polynesian Triangle. 
with Easter Island is at this one end, New Zealand is down here, uh, Tonga's over in here, uh, the, basically Tahiti is in the center, Hawaiian Islands are up here, and this is all the Polynesian area. Both Hawaii and Easter Island are two of the remotest islands in the world, in fact, uh, far away from others. When, in the, in the late 90s, I was flown to New Zealand to look at this wall by a New Zealand archaeologist. And in New Zealand, the, the mainstream history of New Zealand is that basically Maoris came to New Zealand about 800 years ago, and then uh, eventually Captain Cook kind of discovered New Zealand. But then they found this giant wall uh, in the middle of the North Island of New Zealand. And it had, it was covered by um, volcanic ash that they were able to date as over 2,000 years old. So as in the, they were cutting a logging road through this area, and they basically uncovered this wall. And what was very strange, this was going to change the history of New Zealand. And this is the archaeologist Barry Brailsford from New Zealand. Uh, BBC got involved in this, Government of New Zealand. This was, at the time, really big news. Because what this wall, if it was not natural, if it was some kind of man-made wall, like in Tonga, and they know that people have been in Tonga for 3,000 years at least, then that would actually mean that you know, the history of New Zealand had to be completely changed, and that people have been in New Zealand for well over 2,000 years. You can kind of see, too, how this wall, this is actually a natural crack. But these are the blocks here. And you can see them fitted together right here, coming across. It's quite perfect fitting, very right angles. And uh, if you, you could, this wall is pulling apart, as a matter of fact. And you can look behind it. And then you can see where a small block is actually being knocked out. And so I mean, when they got me on the BBC, and they, they, I said, yeah, this appears to be a man-made wall. This, is, this guy right here is actually the New Zealand government archaeologist who was also sent with me and to be with Barry Brailsford. His job was to disprove this wall and make it a natural thing. Okay, This wall couldn't be artificial as far as the government because it was going to change all the history of New Zealand. So one of the things he did, had to do was then dig under this wall because here was a sheer wall with you know what were apparently totally artificial blocks you know, fitted together. Well, for it to be natural, it had to have been some crystallized blocks or something that just happened to um, you know, shear into these right angles and stuff like that. But the wall had to have fallen forward, because it couldn't be so perfect a perfect face. So what they did was they started digging down, the New Zealand archaeologists, to try and prove that the, the wall had fallen in and there was all this rubble. But they couldn't do it, and they, they couldn't find any evidence that it wasn't really giant blocks fitted together. But still to this day, in New Zealand, uh, you know, this, is a, this is just a bizarre, natural geologic formation. Also, in New Zealand, you do have like these uh, volcano fortresses like this that have been terraced and, and geoformed into natural part natural, part artificial fortresses and things like that. Around Australia, when you go to Australia, the whole idea that Egyptians came to Australia is a popular one down there. And there's a lot of weird stuff, particularly out in Western Australia in the outback, oddball caves, uh, stone blocks in the Kimberleys. They have found small items like um, they found this, this amber obelisk that you see at the top, also uh, certain kinds of stone heads and statues. Uh, this, this is found out in Western Australia. Notice here, this is a you know, cave painting. This guy looks sort of like one of the three wise men or something. He's got a beard. Um, this is an interesting one here, too, because what they think this is in a type of Egyptian dancer Who's, and she would, they would do a thing with their long hair, and they would tie weights at the end of their hair, <coughs> and they could then throw their hair around uh, that was weighted. And that was a very ancient Egyptian kind of a thing to do. This is the famous Piri Reis map that's today in the Top Copy Museum, uh, which is in Istanbul. Uh, it shows uh, parts of Antarctica and South America before they were discovered. 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's a map that was put together like just around uh, 1530 or so, um, only just uh, a couple of decades after Columbus first came to the New World. Yeah, and yet it maps a lot of Antarctica. And yet, and, but Antarctica allegedly wasn't even discovered until several hundred years later. It's thought, too, that with maps ancient sea kings, like the, the uh, Piri Reis map, that, and he said himself that he had put these maps together from much older charts and things like that. This is a guy, this is an Australian adventurer. His name was Len Beadle. He was an outback guide. He was sent by the British government to, the British government wanted to detonate uh, the atom bomb in the 50s. And the, the British did their nuke tests in the outback of Australia, basically. But the British, for some reason, decided that they wanted to detonate their bomb at this one place in South Australia. And they sent Len Beetle there. They said, OK, we want you to go get in your Land Rover, drive out in the desert, and go to this place, because we're going we're gonna, to uh, detonate an atom bomb there. So when he got there to where the British had sent him, he found that there were these ruins there. <coughs> and that there were these platforms there. There were these cut stone blocks. Um, here, blocks like this. And this is an oddball thing, too, that Australian aboriginals weren't, aren't known to, uh, to make any kind of permanent dwellings or, or make you know, cut stone blocks or quarry and stuff like that. Yet, this was, out, this, this was out there in the outback. And in fact, this area today is radioactive, and you can't go there. Because, well, they, you know, they, the British, even though, even though, get this, they found these you know, ancient ruins in the outback of Australia. Yeah, the British said, well, we don't care. We'll, we're detonating our atom bomb there anyway. So the whole idea of uh, with, the, with the Pacific is what they, they within Polynesian legends and things, they have uh, this belief of this lost land of Hawaii. And very much like Hawaii, but Hawaii. And scholars have, you know, wrestled, you know, for the last decade, like, well, where's this place, Hawaii, this legendary homeland of the Polynesians? This guy is a guy named Chris Young. This is the only known photo of him. He was uh, lived in American Samoa. At that time, the, this one little island off American Samoa, they, these guys, they were called um, the Tui Matua. And he was the Tui Matua. He was, according to Samoan beliefs, he was the ruler of the entire Pacific, this guy. If you were the Tui Matua, you had the ability to fly through the air. Um, there's all these legends around this guy, very, very strange. And the Tui Matua does not exist anymore in the Pacific. This is an, a road on Rarotonga. Rarotonga had this megalithic road that went around the island. And in fact, today you can't really see it because the, uh, the Rarotongan government wanted to put a road, their own road around the island. So they actually paved over this ancient megalithic road that was there and just put asphalt on it. <coughs> you know, there was just uh, only a couple of days ago, there was that massive earthquake in Tonga. And that tsunami warning went all over. Uh, and this is a Tongaraki canoe. The Tongans, Tonga is one of the last um, kingdoms in the world. It's the last Pacific kingdom. Tonga is also one of the few countries in the world that was never, ever colonized by uh, European powers. They say only the only two countries were never colonized. One was Tonga, the other was uh, Nepal. North of Tonga, and this is kind of interesting with the recent earthquake and stuff that was in Tonga, there's an island, the most farthest north island is this, in Tonga is this island called Niafu'u. And Niafu'u has on it what's, what's called a megapode bird. And megapode birds are like moas, ostriches, emus. They are large, flightless birds that lay these giant eggs. But they can't figure out how this one little island up in way in northern Tonga has a flightless bird on it. Because these birds can't fly to these islands, they have to walk. So somehow, in ancient times, and geologists can't figure this one out, they say, because they don't believe in a Pacific continent. They don't know how these flightless birds could have gotten to these remote islands in Tonga. 
the whole thing of writing throughout the Pacific, you have uh, this different kinds of writing here. And uh, this writing on the left, that is actually from Mahenjo Daro. It, that's uh, the Harappan civilization today on the border of India and Pakistan. In the middle is uh, Rop uh, Rongo Rongo writing from uh, Easter Island. And on the right is this Greek writing known as Linear A and Linear B. And it's very similar. All these writings have some kind of similarity. Pyramids also existed uh, in Tahiti and other areas. The whole, when you go around to Reatea, Tahiti, Bora Bora, uh, many of the ceremonies and both things were very Egyptian in the feel. And in fact, if you look here, this is a, like a scarab. This is, a, um, this is on Reatea in Tahiti, which is, and this is up a river, and this, there's a bunch of uh, petroglyphs here, and one is apparently of an Egyptian scarab. This is a remote island uh, that is south of Tahiti, and Thor hired all went here. This is Rapa Iti, and uh, this is kind of a Machu Picchu type fortress. You cannot, you're not allowed to go to these islands now. The French government, this is, this is, this is a weird area where they, the French do not allow foreigners to really go to these, these islands for some reason. <laughs>